Uh, welcome to the Nuclear Medicine Molecular Medicine Podcast, the longest running medical podcast. <laughs> My first. Uh, <laughs> your first. Um, so uh, uh, let's start, if you could tell us a little bit about, uh, it's uh, uh, Professor Cope, is mm-hmm. it? Yeah. Okay. Tell us a little bit of where you are and where you work. Um, I work in London at the UCL, UCLH. I'm a neurologist, stroke epileptologist. Um, who came to London 25 years ago to learn PET. Right. I'm still there. Good. Um, now, um, I, we just uh, had a very interesting talk, and, and uh, I think the two things that I, I found uh, most interesting was that uh, near the end of your talk, you talked about a, a, a new tracer. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? About the NMDA? Yes. Um, so we have a tracer which binds to the open NMDA receptor. Yes. and to the pore, um, and we, this has been the holy grail of pet tracer development. And so now we are confident that we have one who actually shows a signal increase, whereas all the other previously ones showed decreases. Right. Suggestive of that the tracer is trapped in the open activated NMDA receptor. Right. So, so um, uh, it's much easier to see hot spots than it is to see cold spots. Yeah. Always in imaging, yeah. uh, the cold spot traces never do very well. Exactly. It's the hot spot traces that tend yeah. to do quite well. Yeah. So that's important. How is this important? How is this hot spot tracer going? How could it be used? Uh, no, um, absolutely. This is far more important to see in, an, in a brain where we know there is atrophy and there will be uh, the consequences of on seizures will be atrophy, so to actually see a signal increase is far more encouraging than seizure reductions. Um, so if we argue that this tracer reflects hyperexcitability of hyperexcitable areas, so now the hypothesis is that by removing this area and um, predicting how well people will do following surgery and scanning them again, Um, following surgery at a time point when we decide should we take them off drugs and is then again will we find further hot spots in the remaining tissue will this be then predictive of their response to drug withdrawal even if they are seizure free at this time Um, so these are the secondary or probably the primary outcomes uh, we are looking for in this study is is this a marker of active disease Right, and the traditional markers used previously have been uh, where FTG is cold, right, on, on PET scans. Mm-hmm. Um, spec is hot, but it's spec, so it's not very good resolution, right? And, and again, not very though. specific. Well, not specific, and there you're probably missing it. You're missing it. What you see is propagation with spec right. in the majority of cases, particularly in those frontal lobe epilepsies. Right. So. And it's, it's far more comp- do, yeah. in terms of the appeal it has to the clinician, an interictal NMDA scan yeah. sounds far more easier to oh, achieve yeah. than... Ictal studies are very experience. difficult to do and, and very difficult to timing, injections, yeah. radiation, so, everything else. Ictal are hard and um, um, so obviously, and the other issue is, is that you know, FTG takes a while to absorb, so you, it's not a particularly good ictal tracer either. No, no, no time to So we wouldn't know. We've done the initial study published last two years ago by uh, Carl McGinnity. Um, was done in a rat bag of, of patients with frequent spikes, etc. We didn't. We saw massive signal increases in this people where we suppose they have very active epilepsy, but we didn't see a good correlation with the amount of spiking, which probably would have been asking too much if you think how little the EEG tells us about the brain right. in terms of... And, and the EEG really tells us, tells us about the surface of the brain yeah. and, and, only, uh, and doesn't tell you about some of the more deep-seated areas yeah. of the brain in particular. Yeah. You could have, you know, so... Lots of things happening in the hippocampus, we know. Hippocampus, yes. Well, it's silent. Right, and, and we've seen the, theories before about the importance of the hippocampus in, in terms of uh, uh, other diseases mm-hmm. and, and so on. 
Uh, which brings me to the second thing I was going to talk to you yeah. about. You mentioned that you'd done some um, studies where you'd resect a tissue following surgery for, yeah. for epilepsy. Yeah. Um, and what did you find in that tissue? So what we see in the tissue taken out by the surgeon is a high degree of, of tau. Right. Uh, and this in elderly people. So right. one has to say that the surgery we to hatch our bats, we looked at people, at old people who had surgery after the age of 50. Um, so we would expect to see a high, some tau there anyway, age-related. Sure. Uh, but what we found was that 93% of these patients had tau deposits to a various degrees uh, compared to only 10% who had amyloid deposits. Right, and so 10% so is pretty low. I, I, but I imagine a lot of these people in their 50s, not, not 70s or 80s, right? Yeah, so they're, well, they, they were operated in their 50s and 60s. So right. that is yeah, that's early be. 50s, what we would expect probably to see. So and what we saw on top of that, and that's very much in line, I think, with the current thinking, is that the tau load correlated with their post with their cognitive performance post-operatively not so much pre-operatively because there are lots of factors which are clearly important for cognitive function in drugs seizures etc but what they did and there's a clear correlation between those who have a lot of tau and declined so we right. see an accelerated decline in after one tau. year in those who had tau in their surgical specimen, which is reflective of tau in the remaining brain. Right. Um, so like we see tau in, um, and I'll probably be interviewing other people mm -hmm. during the course of this meeting, like we see tau as an important mark of neuro neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. and it spreads throughout the brain, do you think this is an indication of just mm -hmm. general neurodegeneration or is it specific to epilepsy? So we do not know. We do not know. We see specific changes, very specific to epilepsy in terms of their distribution. But they are also, when you look at post-mortem brains, um, they are also generally degenerative changes. So it could well be that we have a very specific epilepsy tauopathy here, right? Um, which, or which might be yeah, driven, caused by the seizures, by the vicious cycle of hyperexcitable networks. Um, but we also know that that people with epilepsy are at greater risk of developing Alzheimer's and vice versa. Alzheimer people developing at a higher frequency than right. people with seizures, particularly at an early stage. So there is an intriguing link between yes. the two. Right, but if it was but Alzheimer's, we say, we'd have we'd have amyloid, wouldn't we? We would exactly, and so it can't. So yeah. that's at this stage, we don't see it. Right, so. Are we saying or thinking yeah. that uh, the there was a traumatic brain injury that's led to amyloid, led to tau, and 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 the tau's then led to so the what we found is that there is a correlation between the frequency or the presence of generalized tonic-clonic seizures and tau. Right. So we can say that, that right. not so much traumatic brain injury, but simply whether they had generalized tonic-clonic seizures or not. Right. Which are the more aggressive. Seizures, one would argue. Okay, could we say that mm. that is a form of traumatic brain injury? In a way, if you have hundreds of those seizures, that could, in a day or in a month, that could be very similar to a chronic, traumatic, small brain injury. Okay, and that puts it, it's a very de delicate question you're asking is it that seizures damage the brain? You need to have certain constellations, probably, and then they do. Not in all subjects, seizures are damaging, but if you have possibly genetics, possibly pre constitutions We don't know the APOE status, for example. We wouldn't know, but that would be something to look at. Right, and, and presumably we're, mm. we're perhaps uh, ep epilepsy is a cause of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Well, or the unwell, it's causing a chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Right. Well, it's a core. Well, it would be. Well, or clearly in the. Well, but that is actually so. There must be more to it because the likelihood of actually developing epilepsy after the trauma is small. 
ten percent right. if you have a bullet in your hand. Right. Two percent if you have a mild to moderate. Okay. So it does not happen very. What well. if you have a traumatic brain injury and we show tau or not show tau? Mm. If we show tau, are we more likely to develop epilepsy or not? That we don't know. No one's ever tested that, presumably. No, it's, we don't have the means to do this. And the time, the problem there is, again, that would be very important questions to ask to these. But there is a time, a window you would have to follow these people up up to 20 years. Right. Up to 20 years following the traumatic brain injury, people are at risk of developing epilepsy. Right. So when, when do they... I, okay, when when's the peak of the window? We know they within two years. I think or the numbers now within five years, fifty percent develop it. That's the Annika paper. So they they develop the majority develops it first two years, fifty percent I think is at five years, and then they go on okay. after twenty years. So I mean, you could do a study over that length of time. We've done studies like that for, yeah. for Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. But so you then again, you need to have large numbers, if you think about it. Right. That even in your highest risk group, severe traumatic brain injury, 10%. So you need to scan huge numbers of people. Right. In order to statistically power your study. Yeah. But it might point towards but that. it's still better than what you have in your preclinical. TBI cohort and your preclinical Alzheimer cohorts. How many would you have to scan there? But we do routinely scan hundreds or even thousands of people in those studies. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, we're certainly doing that. We've done that in, in, in um, our ABLE group. We've yeah. uh, scanned hundreds or thousands of people, mm -hmm. well, probably heading towards thousands. So, yeah. um, so and that's it. and that's given us really good results and, and pointed towards therapies for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's pointing in the right direction. Mm. Um, do you think this is a way we could point towards localising for surgery for... for um, no, not no. localising because I think there will be spread. Right. I don't think that there should be spread. But it's, it's in guiding people for surgery. Right. And advising them about their risks after surgery of cognitive decline. Awesome. And that's really what we want to aim at a therapy. So we're talking about therapies for epilepsy, which are surgery or mm -hmm. medicines. The other thing you talked about was was um, uh, was PGP yeah. uh, as a factor in determining whether the medicine's going to work. So so yeah. the yeah. so studies, are, yeah. old studies now, but yeah. but but I think important studies they were used yeah. for looking at oncology and the resistance in oncology yeah. and to apply to resistance in um, in managing epilepsy as well. So yeah. No, no, they're, they're definitely lessons. Like the beauty of the field is really the crosstalk between you and know, very much looking at similar mechanisms and looking at similar But in, in terms of prevention, um, in, in a preclinical setup, and that's what we are after, uh, we, we are this fighting the same war. Right. So, for example, you get someone comes along who's been re uh, hasn't been responding well to their epilepsy medication. We could in, we could scan them to look for a resistance to a PGP, in which case we know they're more likely to have. But that's a problem because there, that's where there's a big difference between the rodent and the man. Right. PGP is massively important in the rodent. Not so important in man. So right. It explains part of it. A small signal. Right. There are many other ECRP, God knows what, drug transporters which we haven't looked at, right. and they will be upregulated if PGP falls out. So th that makes it far, again, complex to a degree that, where you would not be able to change just one turn, one screw. Right. So one wonders in many aspects there. And that's where I think once once you had your first seizure, when you actually you missed the boat, you right. can't turn the Titanic. Yes. The process is gone. Yeah. What's okay. so many complex mechanisms involved at this stage. Right. And getting back to Tau, I mean one of the things we see in, in Alzheimer's is you see Tau spread from a location to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The same thing could be happening in epilepsy. Oh. And and where we see the Tau might not nip 
need to focus of epilepsy. It might, yeah, no, it no, might no, 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 simply be an indicator of how it's spreading right, or how chronic or the yeah, disease is or yeah. how intractable the disease is. Oh, yeah. And if we will only know in the intractable ones, we will never look at the others. Right. Yes. We only get, yeah, so our bi view is very much biased towards, towards those where we know they have bilateral networks, really. Even though we operate and take one out, 30% we know has bilateral disease. Right. And you looked at uh, the networks in terms of the brain with MRI, MRI look at those mm -hmm. those um, resting networks and that and there was some indication that, that that's an indicator in terms of, of where those uh, parts of the brain are involved in epilepsy as well. Yeah, so all the methodology shows into what equally for, for focal seizures arising in one hemisphere that they involve and engage other parts. Yeah. In rising in the temple over there, we have involvement of other structures. Sounds like there's a lot of work to do. Yes. And we need more images because you really didn't show many examples. I guess you, we need to be doing more studies, I guess. Well, yes, I try to restrict to the PET MR, but it's true, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you're suggesting we should be doing more tower imaging that we've got access to in Melbourne? That's for yeah, I'm happy to advise you on this one. <laughs> I'll do that. Well, thank you very much for speaking to us. I appreciate you Great. giving up your time and uh, and uh, good luck with your work. Love. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Robert.